The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear part of a lecture about studying history. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to begin this term's lectures with a discussion of the various sub-disciplines in history. Before I do that, though, can I refer you to the handout you picked up on the way in? It deals with two general topics. The first is, why study history? And the second is, what is history? Neither of these questions has an easy answer. In fact, People have been asking these questions for as long as history has been studied. However, as you are mostly new students to this subject, and we have some students of economics with us also, I feel you should have some background to these basic questions. Anyway, it's all in the handout. I might add that for me personally, the most important reason for studying history is that I find it exciting. Our ancestors can remain, if we want them to, a mystery a closed book, a blackness that we never see into, or we can come to know what motivated them and discover how that led to the world we live in today. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now answer questions 4 to 10. You who have chosen to pursue the study of history are very fortunate. This is a time when we can talk not just about history, but histories. Traditionally, history was seen as one subject, and the subject matter was clear. It was about kings and queens and wars. Additionally, it was about states and empires, or groups of states. This is what we now call political history. The subtopics were the parts of the world, for example, the history of China or of France. History has moved on somewhat, and we can learn a lot about current views of history by looking at the proposed lecture topics in our leading universities. In fact, you'll see that even the simplest definition of history – that it is about what happened in the past, is up for grabs. Some of the more, how shall I put it, progressive areas of study are as much about what should happen in the future. One example of this is the field of postmodern history. Likewise, feminist history looks at the past to make sure the future will be different, and it uses the past to assist in its efforts to make the future as it wants it to be. Somewhere in the middle of these two extremes lie a range of areas of study which have developed over the modern period, replacing the traditional idea of political history. These are by now mostly well established. You can study social history or economic history. Social history asks about the ordinary people and their lives, not just their daily lives, but their contribution to changes in our society. Ordinary people have desires and wishes which they try to put into effect, and this has a massive effect on social development which was not fully understood in the traditional study of history. By the way, one area of traditional history which I forgot to mention, but which has had a resurgence of interest in recent years, is the area of military history. 
This was, of course, of great practical use in more violent times, and unfortunately has become of increasing use and interest academically and practically in our own times. By the way, there is a new series of lectures on military history in our department, as if to demonstrate the truth of what I've just said. Ethnic and multicultural history are further examples of kinds of history which, like social history, differ from the traditional forms. Ethnic history is a modern concern which concentrates on the value systems and beliefs of a people, usually a minority people, which were ignored in the rapid forward march of the rich and powerful nations and states. How various ethnic groups live together and how their traditions change and develop, is the subject of its contemporary cousin, multicultural history. In sum, as I said, you are fortunate to have such a wide choice of things to study in the fields of history. Choose wisely. And finally, it only remains for me to wish you good luck in your studies. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. There are a discussion between a college receptionist, Denise, and a student named Vijay about learning a language. In the first part of the discussion, they are talking about the course Vijay will study. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello. May I help you? Hello. Uh, Is this the right place for me to register to study foreign languages? Yes, it is. May I have your name, please? Vijay. My family name is Paresh. Vijay Paresh. OK. Do you have a telephone number? Yeah. 909-2467. Thank you. Now, which language would you like to learn? We offer French, Italian, Cantonese, Mandarin, Spanish, Portuguese. Um, I'd like to learn Spanish, please. OK. Our classes are conducted in lots of different places. We have classrooms in the city and here in this building. What's this building called? This is Building A. I work near here, so it'd be best to study in Building A. What time do you want to come to lessons? They go on for three hours and they start at 10 a.m., 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. I wish I could come to the daytime lessons, but I can't. So 6 p.m., please. That's our most popular time, of course. Um, Have you ever studied Spanish before? No, I haven't. We describe our classes by level and number. Your class is called Elementary 1. Okay. Uh, When will classes start? Elementary one begins... uh, Just a minute. uh, It begins on August 10. Great. Now what else do I have to do? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. I'm sorry, Vijay. What were you saying? I wanted to know what else I had to do. Oh, of course. 
Please go to the building on the other side of Smith Street. I want you to go to the reception area first. It's just inside the door on the left as you enter from Smith Street. Give them this form. Okay. Do I pay my fees there? No, but the fees office is in the same building. Go past the escalators and you'll see a games shop. It's in the corner. The fees office is between the games shop and the toilets. Thanks. Uh, where can I buy books? The bookshop is opposite the lifts. It's right next to the entrance from Robert Street. Your offices are spread out. Not as badly as they used to be. By the way, we offer very competitive overseas travel rates to our students. Oh, I'd like to look into that. Of course. The travel agency is at the Smith Street end of the building, in the corner next to the insurance office. Thank you very much. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between students Maria and Jack. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about their opinions about some of the things in their universities. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Two four one four double three one. Good afternoon. May I speak to Jack Robert, please? Speaking, please. Hi, Jack. This is Maria. Hello, Maria. How are you getting on there? Fine. I arrived in Nottingham yesterday. I've just settled down and I live on the campus of Nottingham University. Oh, that's good. Do you like the campus? Yes, it's beautiful. What do you think of yours? Edinburgh University? It's marvellous. It's on a hill and very close to the sea. I like it very much. It sounds beautiful. Jack, what's the weather like there? Oh, it's fine and sunny. It's said that the weather here is very nice in summer, but awful in winter. What's the weather like in Nottingham? Well, it's a bit depressing. It's been raining since yesterday. I can't go out, so I have to stay in my room. What about your room? Is it a nice one? Yes, it's small and elegant. How about yours? Mine is an ordinary one. It's a twin study room. I share it with one of my classmates. He's intelligent and very friendly. We're getting on quite well. How's your roommate? She's very nice, but a little bit quiet. She likes reading and seldom speaks. By the way, do you like the Scottish food there? Oh, I like it. It's very delicious. Oh, really? I don't like the food here. It's disgusting. It has no taste. I have to cook for myself in my room. Well, Maria, as the saying goes, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Come on, don't be too choosy. Oh, someone's at the door. I have to answer it, Maria. I'll call you this evening. Bye. Bye. Ellen, a student union officer, is conducting a survey about the university facilities. 
She is asking two students about their opinions. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm Alan and I work for the Student Union. Now, I'd like to hear your opinions about a few things in the university. We've asked for some volunteers to help us conduct this survey into how satisfied students are with the university facilities. First of all, let's take the lecture rooms. We could score them, for instance, 1 is excellent, 2 satisfactory, 3 rather poor and 4 really bad. Robert, you first, please. What do you think about the lecture rooms here? Not so good, I'm afraid. I would score three. They're too small for one thing. Sometimes we can hardly find a seat. Yes, but that doesn't happen very often. Personally, I think they're all right. They're comfortable, and the acoustics are quite reasonable. It doesn't matter where you sit, you can always hear the lecture. I would give two for them. How do you feel about the car parking facilities? Are they adequate? You must be joking. I can never find a car parking space when I need one, and when I finally do, it's a very long walk to the university's teaching building. I'd give it a four. I'm afraid I also agree. We need more car parks urgently. This is perhaps one of the major shortcomings of this campus. It gets a four from me as well. I come to the university 20 minutes early, just so I can drive around looking for a parking space. What about the computer centre then? I think it's first class. The software base contains a large selection of learning programs, language games and word processing facilities. I would give a score of one. I quite agree with you. It's very modern and also under the supervision of qualified staff who can offer help to us while we work, should we need them. Oh, good. Well, what do you think of the library facilities? Let's say the periodical room first. Well, I've scored that three. I'm sorry to have to say, but, er, uh, I think the room has poor lighting, and I'm disappointed about that. I've given it a score of one. As far as I'm concerned, it's excellent and well stocked. Thank you, Robert and Mary. Now, let's turn to the photocopying facilities. Hmm, I would give it a score of two. Personally, I think it's all right and it's very helpful. Huh? I would score three. I think it's too expensive for photocopying, and there are not enough machines. Sometimes we have to stand in a line. OK. Now let's talk about the... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on local businesses at a university business centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The subject of this evening's talk at the North Bank Business Centre is local businesses in the area surrounding the university and the benefit they bring to the employment prospects of people in the local area, especially young people at the beginning of their career. 
We established the centre in response to approaches from several business people in the area who had wanted to start up new businesses but who had not managed to find any help locally and did not know where to turn. Moreover, they had all, without exception, come up against enormous bureaucratic obstacles. We therefore invited them in as a group to meet the members of the department and the students. Stemming from that is the centre, which now focuses mainly but not exclusively on business startups. Just after the centre was set up, Snapshot research conducted by the department over the telephone gave some startling results. The information about local businesses revealed that three out of every ten local business startups that we could collect information on had failed within the first six months, and another five had gone within the year, leaving only two. The most common reasons given for the business's closing were First, high rents, which are 33% higher than the national average due to the area being very central. Second, lack of knowledge about grants, basically because of ignorance about how to access them. And thirdly, a lack of business support because they did not know where to obtain advice from. Since the centre came into existence three years ago, we have helped change this climate of failure. The current statistics show a remarkable turnaround in the fortunes of local businesses. And now, after a year, only two businesses close out of every ten, compared to eight before the centre was set up. Six local businesses are now taking part in a work placement and monitoring scheme which is of mutual benefit to ourselves and the companies involved. O Foods, a small start-up company with nine employees involved in organic food and based at a local market, has one final year graduate doing a year-long study on improving the stock turnaround. This was a particular problem because the company found that they were losing sometimes up to 30% of their stock. Another startup is Innovations, which deals with producing video games. This company, which employs only five people, all under the age of 25, is receiving support in attracting business partners and achieving production targets. In the smaller business category, Sampson's Limited, a courier company which is interested in developing a taxi service, is being offered help with their business expansion plans. Another small niche company called Vintage Scooter, which specialises in revamping old scooters, is taking part in a product monitoring scheme, offering customer service up to a year after purchase to check the quality of their restoration. The first of the two medium-sized companies that the scheme is monitoring is Build Limited, which employs 47 people. A comparison of their products and services with other businesses in the area is being carried out by a researcher who is trying to support them in their efforts to extend the company's product range. The last company, Jones Systems, is perhaps the most interesting because it has been the victim of considerable personnel problems which have been affecting the day-to-day -day operations of the company. And so, we are looking at conflict management and team building within the company. To sum up, advisors help the companies look at different business options and models, apply for grants, deal with employment issues, systems creation, and also provide accommodation at the centre to help them start up. E-mentoring for fledgling businesses is also in operation for those who find it difficult to attend the centre personally. The programme is funded by grants from local authorities. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute 
to check your answer. 